Leviticus chapter number 7. We'll begin in verse number 11. The Bible says, And this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he, ha which he shall offer unto the Lord. If he offer it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour, fried. By the way, right there. Fried food is in the Bible. Isn't that what it says? Fried? So all you uh, Karens and snowflakes says you can't have fried food. Well, God, God is the one instituted, so take it up with him. Verse 13. Besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offerings. And of it he shall offer one out of the whole oblation for an heave offering unto the Lord, and it shall be the priest that sprinkleth the blood of the peace offerings. And the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day that it is offered. He shall not leave any of it until the morning, Brother Jim. See that? No leftovers. Shall eat it the same day it's offered. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. No leftovers. So quit giving me grief because I don't eat leftovers. I'm just trying to be a Bible Christian. Huh? Isn't that what it said? All right. All right, let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be in your house tonight. God, thank you for the good singing. Lord, we ought to thank you for our salvation. And Lord, we are thankful for everything you ever touched changed. Lord, we desire your touch tonight. Lord, I'm reminded of that message Brother Larry Seals preached years ago. Without your touch, we're not much. So, Father, we long for your touch. We long for your presence. We pray you'd help us tonight. We pray you'd open our minds to understand and open our hearts to receive. And, Lord, I pray we'd have uh, a fa Thanksgiving feast around your word tonight that would prepare us for the days to come. Now, bless your people. Lord, you know where they where they are. You know what they're facing, what they have faced, what they'll face in the days to come. Lord, I pray for those that, Lord, may be carrying a heavy load tonight. I pray you'd lift their load and bear them up. I pray if there be any in our midst tonight that's never been saved, that's never been changed, Lord, I pray tonight would be the night of their salvation. Father, I pray for anybody here tonight that's just seeking your will, you'd manifest it to them tonight. Father, I just pray that, Lord, you just settle everything to thy praise and thy glory. And God, I pray again, you'd bless your people. Be with those that are sick. I pray for Juliet undergoing surgery. I pray you'd help her through that. I pray you'd guide the physicians. I pray she'd heal well. And I pray for her. I pray for the sick. Lord, thank you for Miss Crystal getting a good report this week. I pray every week they just get better and better. And Lord, I pray you'd continue to touch her and help her. I pray for others that are sick. God, you'd touch them. Those that are providentially hindered, you'd be with them. Now help us tonight. Bless us from the scriptures. We'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we do pray. Amen. Amen. I do not have time to get into all of chapter number 7 and all the integral little parts of how it all works. But I do want you to notice some things about these verses. I want you to notice the institution or the instituting of an offering under the law by the Lord. Look at verse number 11. It said, And this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he shall offer unto the Lord. Uh, can I say that in this chapter, this is the fifth offering that is instituted under the law by the Lord. Uh, can I say that the first four offerings, uh, uh, the burnt offering, the meat offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering earlier in the chapter, all were offered uh, for the atonement of sin. Uh, 
Can I say this offering is an offering for peace? Can I say no one can ever have peace with God until sin is atoned for? Amen. But isn't it amazing that the fifth offering is the peace offering? The number five is always representative of grace. Uh, aren't you glad that the offerings all represent the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, but the burnt offering, the meat offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, uh, he took all of our sin to Calvary. Uh, and when we trusted in the Lord, uh, can I say that we received peace with God uh, because of the grace of God? Uh, what a blessing for this institution under the law that became fruition under grace. Uh, what a blessing. Uh, we see the institution of the peace offering. Uh, notice the ingredients of the peace offering. Look in verses 12 and 13. It said, If ye offer it for thanksgiving, then he shall offer with a sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil, of fine flour fried beside the cakes. Uh, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread uh, with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offering, offerings. Uh, can I say the Lord never did anything just to do it, and he never did anything by accident. God is a very detailed and oriented God. Uh, everything in the Word of God is placed there uh, by distinct direction of the Holy Ghost, and it is uh, for our ensample, and it is for our example. Uh, and can I say, under uh, uh, studying all this, you say, what does all that mean? Uh, it all pictures something. It's all a type of something. Uh, let me go into these ingredients in a little bit of detail. Uh, we find that, first of all, he mentions uh, that they're to offer unleavened cakes uh, and unleavened wafer, wafers. Uh, uh, unleavened uh, simply means pure. Uh, and can I say what a blessing uh, that in the Lord Jesus he was pure. Uh, he had no sin, uh, but he became sin that we might become the righteousness uh, of God. Uh, uh, notice uh, it mentioned unleavened cakes. Uh, uh, unleavened cakes is representative uh, of Jesus Christ himself, the bread of life. Uh, what a blessing. He's our pure Savior, uh, and he was the bread of life. Uh, what a blessing we were able to partake of him uh, because he offered himself and became broken bread and poured out wine uh, on the cross of Calvary, uh, and we were able to be recipients uh, of the goodness of God. Uh, again, we see that it mentions unleavened wafers. Uh, what that represents is life itself. Uh, and can I say, outside the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no life. Uh, he gave us life. Uh, we were dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, can I say, uh, uh, lost people all around us are breathing and walking and functioning, uh, but to God, they are dead. Uh, and one of these days if they don't get saved they'll die in their sins uh, and they'll spend all of eternity uh, uh, paying for their own sins uh, because they did not trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and receive life uh, I'm glad, hallelujah he gave us life uh, and life more abundantly in this life uh, and we received eternal life everlasting life uh, he is our life and I bless the Lord uh, outside of him uh, we'd have no hope. You know what you ought to be thankful for this week? You have life. Uh, so we see unleavened is pure. Unleavened in cakes is Christ the bread of life is what it represents. Uh, unleavened in wafers represents life. Uh, but then it comes down and it just mentions cakes. Notice what it said in verse 12. It said un unleavened in uh, uh, cakes with oil, unleavened in wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil. Here we find just cakes, not unleavened cakes. And cakes represents uh, you and I and those that are redeemed, but we're redeemed not by ourselves. We couldn't redeem ourselves. We were weak in the flesh. 
And so cakes that is not unleavened shows that we have trusted in the Lord and be recipients of his life, uh, but we did not uh, become recipients of his life on our own merit because uh, we were weak in the flesh. Uh, there was nothing we had to offer God uh, that would merit his favor, uh, but hallelujah, he granted us his favor through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and then it mentions uh, in all of these sacrifices, uh, leavened with oil. Oil is, is most of the time, 99% of the time, a picture of the Holy Spirit of God. And can I say, uh, when we got saved, we got saved because the Holy Ghost con convicted us of our sins, and the Holy Ghost drew us to God, uh, and when we got saved, the Holy Ghost indwelled us, uh, and we've received uh, that Holy Spirit of promise. What a blessing. Uh, so everything you see was done... Uh, and working with the oil. And can I say, we ought to desire fresh oil every time we come to the house of God because uh, we need His working in our midst. Uh, then it mentions flour. You all know what flour is if you've ever been around a kitchen. It's usually white. Uh, but here it says fine flour. This is the best of the best. What is fine flour? It, is, uh, it represents the pure, sinless, holy life of Jesus. Had he not been pure and sinless, there had been no hope for you and I. Right. He had to be pure and keep the law and be acceptable unto God in order for us to be accepted through Christ. And I bless the Lord. Do not bind all these modern movies and all these modern things which shows Jesus uh, being tempted in his mind and having a lustful affair with Mary Magdalene. Uh, or uh, some said that he had uh, uh, homosexual relationships with the disciples. Uh, all that's wicked and fleshly and written by ungodly people. Uh, you want a true picture of Christ? Read your Bible. And your Bible lets you know he was a sinless sacrifice for you and I. Hmm? Amen. But then we find in verse 13 it mentions leavened bread. Besides the cakes he shall offer for his offering leavened bread. Hmm? <clears throat> Why would he have unleavened cakes and unleavened wafers? Which is really a little cake, a little piece of bread, kind of like a donut hole. Why would he call for unleavened that and then later calls for leavened bread well that represents something very personal to you and I it shows that even though a soul is saved it still has to deal with wicked flesh yes. the apostle Paul had to die daily how much more you and I we're to crucify this flesh anew we're to put this flesh under subjection we're to present ourselves a living sacrifice uh, every day to the Lord uh, and we're to put this flesh where it needs to be under bondage Amen. we can only do that if we're strong in the Lord the power of his might we read the Bible and pray and meditate on the Bible and walk with the Lord then right. my dear friends you can crucify your flesh but make no mistake just because you're saved don't mean that you've re reached a place where sin will never bother you don't think that you, just because, you know, you're old like the colonel, you, you never be tempted to, to, to sin. As long as you've got flesh, you'll be tempted. Right. Amen. Uh, the devil may not tempt you with things that he tempts other people, but he'll tempt you. Uh, that's why it's important to stay around the things of God. What the, what the devil tries to do is isolate you, get away from church, get away from the Bible, get away from the things of God, get away from the people of God, uh, and then he'll put all kinds of junk in your mind. Yes, sir. Never think that you uh, have arrived and never think you can handle it. Amen. Let me just say this, there's been bigger and better people than all of us fell to, fell to sin. Right. Sure. Amen. Been greater preachers than I'll ever be fall to sin. Young people, don't think you can handle it. You can't handle it. Amen. You don't even know how to wipe your nose yet. Hmm? You say, Brother Doug, that's awful cruel. Well, when you get about 25, come back and talk to me. You'll say, Brother Doug, you was right. I didn't even know how to wipe my nose back then. 
Uh, why? Because when you're young people's age, you think you can handle everything. You think you're smarter than your parents. You think you're smarter than everybody in the building. Uh, come back and see us about 10 years. You realize how dumb you are right now. Hmm? Uh, uh, say, preach, that's not very edifying. Well, it's true. The Bible says, for a man that thinketh him, uh, for a man, to, I gotta go read it. Just lift me. That's what happens when you get old. As soon as I get there, I'll remember it. Huh? I'll get there. Hold on. I ain't gonna let the devil get victory over me. Uh, Wherefore, let, let him that thinketh he stand and take heed lest he fall. Uh, we're not to esteem ourselves better than others. Um, but when you think you can handle it, you're setting yourself up for fall. Mm. We see the institution of the peace offering. We see the ingredients of the peace offerings. But notice, if you will, the intent of the peace offering. Look again in verse number 12. If he offer it for a thanksgiving... The peace offering was to coincide with thanksgiving. Matter of fact, it's a thanksgiving offering. And I don't know when it became popular that we're entitled and that God is supposed to give to us and then one day out of a year we'll just thank Him for it. If you read the devotion this morning, you'll find out that a thanksgiving offering isn't standing up in a service like this tonight and saying, I want to thank God for His blessings on me. That is not a thanksgiving offering. That is praise. And we're always to offer praise unto the Lord. Right. A thanksgiving offering is a sacrifice to show God how thankful we are for His blessings on us. With all that in mind, I want to preach on this thought tonight. I want to preach on the spirit of thanksgiving. The spirit of thanksgiving. What kind of spirit we ought to have towards God in being truly thankful. Can I say the spirit of thanksgiving is one, as I just mentioned, of an offering. Again, in verse number 12, it says, If he offer it for a thanksgiving... In verse number 13, he says, Besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offerings. Psalms uh, 50 and 14 says, Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High. We find that uh, 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 whenever you find thanksgiving, it's mentioned 27 times, the vast majority it is talking about an offering to God. It is talking about consciously giving something to God to show Him how thankful you are. Amen. What have you offered God to show your thanksgiving? You ought to have a spirit of gratitude and that you're willing to first of all offer yourself. Amen. And then secondly, offer Him everything you have because it's not yours anyway. And when you learn to offer God in the right spirit, a spirit of thanksgiving to God, He'll not only allow you to enjoy everything He's blessed you with, you'll find He'll bless you more. Oh, yeah. But it is an offering. Too many people have the mindset that their offering is what they put in the plate. Can I say, that's God's too. Offering is a spirit in your heart. And if you learn to offer yourself, whatever goes in the plate is nothing. That's the bare minimum. When you offer yourself, He has you every day of the week. He has your attention. He has your mouth as His mouthpiece. He has your hands as His handiwork. He has your feet. He has every part of you to do a work in this world. Why do you think God left us here after He saved us? 
Was it to come to church three times a week and put something in the plate? He left us here to be his ambassador, his representative on earth that he could work through to show others how great he really is. We are to be conduits. Everybody know what a conduit is? It's a plastic pipe that something runs through. We're to be the conduit, the pipe, and he's to run through us and we're to do what he says. God help us to have a spirit of thanksgiving. It is an offering. Can I say the spirit of thanksgiving is one of omission. We omit to God some things. Number one, we omit to God our helplessness. I like that old song, I can't even walk without him holding my hand. Do you realize it's God that got you out of bed? Do you realize it's God that puts breath in your body? Do you realize it's God that gives you the ability to think and comprehend? Do you realize it's God that puts a, 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 the strength in your body to do what you need to do? Do you realize it's God that puts food in your cupboard? It's God who gives you a place to work. It's God who gives you transportation. It's God who puts fuel in your transportation. Do you realize it's God that allowed you to live in America, the greatest country on the face of the earth? Do you realize it's God who founded this church? Do you realize it was God who brought you to this church? Do you realize it was God who died for you and saved you? Do you, you realize without God you couldn't do anything? Right. Amen. In John 15, I understand they were studying that Bible Institute last night. Without Him, we can do nothing. Right. The spirit of thanksgiving is us admitting to God. Without Him, we're helpless. Amen. And it'd be good for us to add on to that and useless. Because without Him, we are. It's admitting. It's an admission of one's helplessness. It's an admission of one's humility. You know what would help Christianity? You know what would help our church? If folks would learn humility. When you come before God broken and humble, that God will even look your way. You know why some of you don't have the blessings of God? You know why some of you uh, have a real tough time right now and you're struggling? Because you're full of pride. God resisted the proud, give the grace to the humble. Amen. You know what humility is? Humility is really knowing all your strengths knowing all your weaknesses and abiding therein, but admitting your weaknesses unto God and admitting your strengths unto God and asking Him to help you therein. Amen. You know what humility is? Humility is regardless of the blessing or the trial, regardless of the mountaintop or the valley, you humbly come for, before God and thank Him for it and ask Him, for direction. Yes, sir. Because you don't know which way to turn. Amen. Can I say, the spirit of thanksgiving is an omission of our own helplessness, an omission of humility. God, I really can do nothing without you. And God, I really am not able without you. And God, I realize that you're my helper. I realize you're my strength. Amen. And I realize when I'm weak, then I'm I strong because I have to depend on you. It's when you come before God and you come before Him in the right spirit. Too many people, Brother Josh, the only time they come before God is when they want something. You think that moves the heart of God? No. Can I say, the spirit of thanksgiving is also an omission of honesty. We'd have revival, folks, become, just come before God honestly. Again, we got so much pride, we put on a false face, we don't want people to know the truth about things. So we hide under the mask that everything is great. 
Can I say transparency is a wonderful thing? It starts when we're honest before God. Do you think God doesn't know everything about you? Do you think God is caught by surprise anything that's going on in your life or is there anything that's ever went on in your life? Amen. He knows the number of the hairs on your head. He knows your thoughts. He knows the intents of your heart. He knows your down sitting, your uprising. God knows Amen. everything. Amen. And sometimes all God wants, Brother Ray, is for us to come before him honestly and tell him that we know what he already knows. When we're honest before God, then we can be honest before man. Hmm. But we don't want to be honest. We want to put on our shirt and tie and our nice dresses and come in and act like we have no problems. That's why God don't move. The house of God's full of a bunch of folks that aren't being honest. Do you think God's going to bless lying? Let's just face it, if you're not honest, then what are you? What are you? You're lying. Right. You're lying to yourself. You're lying to your family. You're lying to God. You think God's going to bless that? Amen. Nope. So the spirit of thanksgiving is you become so overwhelmed at the bounty and the blessings of God that you just become honest. And by the way, the greatest bounty and blessing, and it's already been sung about tonight, is that he saved us. That ought to still overwhelm you. Yeah. Amen. Mm. Can I say the spirit of thanksgiving is an offering, it's an omission, but it's also an obligation. This was a law. This was not to be deviated from. This was the commandments of God given to his man who later went and gave it to the people. It was passed down from generation to generation to generation. And when Israel was faithful to keep the law, God blessed when Israel refused to do the law or forgot about the law, that's when judgment came. Can I say the spirit of the thanksgiving is one of obligation. We are obligated to God. I believe 1 Corinthians is still in the Bible. We've been bought with a price. Our life is no longer our own. You do not own yourself. So quit trying to take ownership of yourself. We are obligated to God. Amen. Matter of fact, we're obligated to Him first and foremost. Right. Yep. Now, I wasn't going to be mean, but it's just my nature. <laughs> Let me go back and talk to Brother Phil since I already picked on him. Lord have mercy, Phil, could you sit any farther back? Why don't you just go sit in my office? <laughs> yeah, Lord have mercy. But Jesse, you're going to have to carry me back to the pulpit. <laughs> Answer me this question, okay. wise Dr. Phil. I don't know about that. <laughs> At the judgment seat of Christ. It's a scary day. It is going to be a scary day. Mm -hmm. What about all them people that chose to miss church on Wednesday night to cook for family? Mm -hmm. How are they going to look in Jesus' eyes that day? Yeah, they'll be looking down. Mm-hmm. Crying. Mm-hmm. Have mercy on me. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Which you think is more important? Being obligated to family right. and preparing a meal that they're going to eat tomorrow or being obligated to the Lord. Obligated to the Lord. Absolutely. Amen. Mm. I still believe that Hebrews chapter 10 is in the Bible where it says, Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together except for Thanksgiving Eve. Is that what it says? How about when church falls on Christmas Day? Hmm? Whoa, got real quiet there. I might as well get that one in. It is a holiday where we're worshiping the Lord about His coming, so that means let's not have church. You know, the Catholics will have 49 Mass services between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Huh? Seven Hills will have 18 or 20 that week. But yet the Baptists have to call off, and we claim we have the truth. Colonel, I sure wouldn't want to face the Lord and say, hey, we really enjoyed Christmas. We enjoyed celebrating you, but we just didn't go to your house. Mm -hmm. Think that's going to hold any weight? <laughs> Where's our obligation? Right. To family? To gifts? 
Yes, the greatest gift, Amen. Jesus. Amen. Might as well get this dig in. You know about 98% of everything to do with Christmas is pagan, don't you? So what are you going to be, a pagan or a Christian? Oh boy, really stirring it up tonight. It's nowhere in my notes, but I'm having a good time. Who are we obligated to? I know who we're supposed to be obligated to. And the spirit of thanksgiving is one of obligation to where you make it known to God you are obligated to Him. Well, that went over like a lead balloon. It's Dr. Phil's fault. Can I say it's not only an obligation to God, but it's a generational obligation. Do you know we would not truly understand the spirit of thanksgiving had not our forefathers died for the faith and left it to us? Amen. Do you know the next generation won't know anything about being obligated to God unless we leave it for them? Right. Amen. It is a generational obligation. When we were in St. Lucia, Brother Adrian taught so wonderfully, and he let them know, well, we're just one generation from not having a church at all. Right. Good. Go to the most, most churches. You don't see many young people. You don't see many people in their 20s and 30s. Hmm? If the Lord don't come back, who are we going to leave it to? It's an obligation to the next generation. Do you know why a lot of people skip out on, on Thanksgiving Eve and skip out on Christmas Day when church falls up? Because their parents did. They learned that. Hmm. I appreciate you being here tonight. I would have preached if only two of you showed up. But I appreciate you being here tonight. Appreciate the stand you've made. I know cooking for Thursday is a big deal. I know there's a lot involved. Miss Nett cooked all afternoon. Huh? I understand that. I know there's a lot involved. I know that uh, 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 holidays are a big deal and family puts a lot of pressure on you. Here's a good, uh, good idea. Why don't you invite them to church with you when it falls on Christmas? Amen. That went over like a lead balloon too. Said so they'll never come. How do you know? Invite them. Might shock you. And if they don't come, at least they know who you're obligated to. Amen. The spirit of thanksgiving is one of obligation. An obligation to God. An obligation that's generational, but it's also an obligation of gladness. I am not sad that I'm a Christian. Right. Amen. I'm not upset when Christmas falls on, on Sunday or Wednesday. It doesn't upset me. I'm glad that Jesus came. I'm glad that Jesus died for my sin. I'm glad that he saved me. I'm glad that he's tolerated me since I've been saved. Uh, I'm glad he still hears my prayers. Uh, I'm glad that I still can hear from him, from his word. Uh, I'm glad to be able to assemble with the saints of God uh, and be able to sing songs of praise unto God, uh, be able to enjoy one another's company centered around Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm not sad tonight. Uh, I'm glad for what God's done in my life. I'm glad for the blessings of God. I'm glad for the goodness of God. I'm glad and I recognize where all my blessings came from. I recognize uh, 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 all that God's done in my life. Uh, listen, uh, I appreciate secular family, but the greatest family I have is this family in here tonight, my church family. Uh, and hey, can I say this? My best friends in the world are in here tonight. Uh, what a blessing to, uh, to be able to just fellowship, be with God's people. Uh, hey, we don't have to worry about what's going on in the world. Who cares? We're in God's house, uh, and we're looking for Jesus to come. Huh? I have a spirit of gladness. I'm glad I'm saved. Mm. Uh, can I say even when I, I got problems, I'm still glad I'm saved. Mm -hmm. 
Especially when I got problems, I'm glad I'm saved. When I don't feel good, I'm glad I'm saved. When I feel like I, I'm carrying the weight of the world, I'm glad I'm saved. When I'm on the mountaintop, I'm really glad I'm saved. But I'm glad I'm saved, huh? What a blessing to be saved tonight. Amen. And it's an obligation of God. Listen, uh, there used to be an old song that I'm a slave to the master. But can I say, it's a servitude of gladness. It's not a drudgery being saved. And the Lord doesn't put more on us than we're able to bear. And the Lord's not an evil taskmaster. Hey, he's a master blesser. He's good to us. Uh, he says, give me your heavy load. Give me all your problems. Give me all your trials. Uh, uh, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy. Uh, what a blessing to be saved tonight. Amen. I'm glad I'm saved. Hmm. Listen. The joy of the Lord's your strength. And when you let the world become your obligation, you lose your joy. That's why so many of God's people aren't truly glad tonight. Amen. I shudder to use that word happy, because that's a temporal term anyway. But joy and gladness are Bible terms. And can I say, in Christ you have that. But when you're saved, but you're not walking and obligated to God like you should be, you are of all men most miserable. Right. That's why some of you are miserable tonight. You let the temporary control your thinking. Control your spirit tonight. Hmm? But if you came in here with your mind on the Lord and the goodness of the Lord instead of on turkey, huh? Ben Franklin wanted to make the turkey the national bird. You know, he was lost. Uh, uh, what's majestic about a turkey? Uh, I mean, you got to put four pounds of gravy on it just to get it down. I mean, you know, it's not that good stuff. Uh, thank God for the colonel and chicken. Huh? Some of you are so weighted down with temporal things. Now, they may be big things, and they may be oppressing things, but your things are controlling you because you're not, your, your obligation's wrong. If you had Christ first in your life, those, places, those things would find their place, but it wouldn't be the main place. And any time something overwhelms you so much that it controls your spirituality, it's wrong. Yeah. Right. And too many people come in with a load. Sometimes a load of grief. Sometimes a load of guilt. Sometimes a load of junk. Sometimes a load of problems. And you drag that into the house of God. And while you're here, you're consumed with it. And you don't hear the preaching. You don't hear the singing. And when you leave, you tote it out with you. And you wonder why your life's miserable. Amen, when you're obligated to God, you learn to check that stuff. Amen. And always put God first. Yes. I learned a long time ago, if he can't handle it, I'm in trouble. Right. That's right. Yes. But I got good news, he can handle it. So no matter what it is, I'll be okay. I'll just serve him. I don't know why I said all that. It's not my notes. My note says of gladness. That's what it said. Last thing tonight, I'll be done. The spirit of thanksgiving is one of opportunity. It's an opportunity to give back. Worshiping God is giving back unreservably to God. He's been so gracious to, him, to us. I don't know about you. Have you ever just asked the Lord what you could do to please Him? I mean, think of all He's done for us. 
And then think about how little he really asks of us. Did you ever just ask God, God, what can I do to just honor you? See, it's an opportunity for us to give back to God to show Him how truly grateful we are. And can I say, gratefulness is more than just words. Gratefulness is a pattern of showing what truly is in your heart. It's an opportunity to give back to God. It's also an opportunity to glorify God. Can I say that's why man was created? To bring honor and glory to God. Then man chose to sin. And ever since that, sin was passed upon all men and it has been a struggle for us to truly glorify God. Matter of fact, it goes against our fleshly nature to glorify God. So when we truly make a concentrated effort to give back to God and bring glory to Him, do you think that doesn't please Him? Do you remember when Moses was on the mountain... And the people of Israel made the golden calf and they was having all kinds of revelry in the camp and God wanted to destroy them. And Moses pleaded for them. How often do you think God wants to destroy man? When he looks around this old wicked world, I I, I really feel in my heart God doesn't find much pleasure in what's going on in this world. He's letting sin run its course. And he's soon coming back to take his church out of here. Don't you think it behooves you and I to at least strive to do something to please him in all of his displeasure with mankind? You see, the spirit of thanksgiving is the opportunity to actually glorify him. to offer and to place Him in in importance and to show Him how much we truly love and appreciate Him. And friends, when we do that, that can help but show Him shining on us a little bit which shows that He is pleased with what we've done. Nowhere in the Bible when an offering is truly offered in purity to God and God is pleased with it that He doesn't let people know that He's pleased with it. Even when Jesus hung on the cross, it pleased the Father to bruise Him. And when you and I become broken bread and poured out wine for the cause of Christ and we offer ourselves a living sacrifice and we truly glorify the Lord in and through our being God's pleased and he gives you a peace to let you know he's pleased it's not only an opportunity to give back and an opportunity to glorify God but it's also an opportunity to guide others to him and isn't that why he left us here to show others the goodness of God And what greater way to show others the goodness of God than us becoming a living sacrifice for God in the spirit of thanksgiving and God being pleased with our life and shining on our life so others can see, really, the true joy and goodness of being a Christian. When I look around at modern Christianity, if I was a lost man, I'd say, I don't want that. When I look at the average person that goes to a Baptist church, if I was a lost man, I'd say, I don't want what they got. That wouldn't help me. You know what will help them? Seeing the spirit of thanksgiving in our lives. 
Most people think that most Christians are hypocrites and thieves. Why don't we show them something different? Amen. By having the spirit of thanksgiving every day in our lives. Because we ought to be thankful every day. We ought to be grateful every day for the goodness of God. So tomorrow when you're with family, you're with friends, do a little inventory of how good God's been to you. Most of us will have more to eat than some whole cities or villages in other parts of the world. Other than Jim, us that doesn't have leftovers, we will throw away more food. Than a lot. He told me, he said, I live for the leftovers Friday. The best thing about Thanksgiving is eating it the second time. Wrong. I'll eat it the second time next year on Thanksgiving. Huh? Now I'll keep the desserts. That's not leftover. That's getting two. Take inventory. How good God's been to your family. How much God's really blessed you. Yeah. Oh, we can always look and find problems. We can always look and find things, you know, we can find fault in. But look at how good God's been to you. Yeah. Right. Amen. And then ask yourself a question. How good have you been to God? Because that's really the spirit of thanksgiving. Being good back to God. Because he's been good to us. Jordan said it so good in his devotion today that the offering of thanksgiving is not something that we do publicly that we can get praise from. It's what we do privately to God that he rewards us openly for it. God help us to embrace the spirit of thanksgiving every single day and if we truly become thankful we'll have revival like this world has never seen because we'll have his presence like no New Testament church has ever had God help us to learn to be thankful alright I'm done brother Clint come get a song maybe you need to come and thank him how good he's been to you Maybe you need to come and be honest with him. Maybe you need to come and offer him something tonight. Maybe that John, uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, living sacrifice comes into play tonight. But maybe tonight you just need to come and tell him you love him. Maybe he spoke to you tonight and you don't know him, but you sure would like to. We we'll invite you to come. We'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you how you can be saved. You can be saved tonight. Nothing like being saved. So he's picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, we, do, Lord, we don't have the words to properly thank you for your goodness and your choice blessings. Lord, we sure do want to show you how much we love you and are thankful. Now, Lord, you've blessed us all so much. Now, help your people and help us all, me included, to truly learn the spirit of thanksgiving and, Lord, to practice it every single day. God, help some folks tonight. Bless these that are in the offering, or in the altar. Whatever they're offering you, whether it's thanksgiving, praise, love, or repentance, God help them. God, those that have heavy loads, Lord, I pray you'd lighten their load. And I pray that, God, you'd answer their prayers. Bless now tonight. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.